so they can share whatever they're excited about or new you know, developments, something that's new or exciting in the market. That's what we've been doing. And uh, we're happy to, uh, to have great speakers on the show. So um, for the, the people that don't know, my name is Sander de Bruin. Today I'm calling from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, in Europe, local time, 1.35 p.m. And I think there's a different time zone in you, uh, your town, Gordon, because you're in L.A., right? Yeah, it, it's still at 5.30 in the morning PSD, Pacific Standard Time. I thought I was going to catch a break for a minute and have it be at 6.30, but just fate worked out differently. So, yes, 5.30 a.m., it is dead pitch black outside, and it is what it is. Good morning. Okay. Well, it's good, good that you have it. And, and by the way, our, our special guest, Brad, also is a trooper. He's in LA with me, though not with me, and he's up at 5.30, so we got to give a big shout out to Brad. Good on you guys. So so be, before we go to Brad and James, maybe maybe Gordon also for yourself, because most of the people don't know, know you already, but maybe there are some people who don't know you. Maybe you give a brief introduction. Sure, sure. just, you know, and again, it's not the Gordon show, but you know, the just real quick, I'm an attorney. I practice um, entirely on crypto and blockchain law. I'm based in Los Angeles, but my practice is international. I do a lot of speaking internationally. I used to do that in person. Now I do that by Zoom. So you could say I pretty much practice law for my living room now with two cats. And like Sander mentioned, this kind of started on a lark. We decided to just combine our networks and do something fun at 5.30 in the morning PSD. I don't know how he talked me into that, but we've been going strong. We're now on episode 17. So it's been going for a while. Sandra, I talked to you more than I talked to my wife, which is not good. Um, but anyways, it's not the Gordon show. It's not the Sandra show. Let's explain the ground rules and then get on to our guests. Yeah, cool. So any questions, guys, put it in the chat box in the second part, like I mentioned before, we get <coughs> alumni speakers and, and, and our guests uh, in, in the show. But maybe Gordon, because you know Brett and James sure. better than I do. Than I'll, I do. I'll, I'll watch. So, but you will know them well also. So for I everyone like in the audience and for Brad and James, I'm gonna do like a very sh short, soft intro of them and then let them self intro as I really interrupt from time to time. Um, I've known, I've known, I'll start with Brad. I've known Brad for uh, several years now. Um, originally through a social organization, then working on a few projects together. He's a, a very smart guy. He's a very, comes off as a very calm, mellow guy, but he's very intense in his own way. Uh, has lots of experience with crowdfunding and Reggae Plus raises, and then crypto. I'll let him flush that out a little bit more. Um, and his company is Beyond Enterprises, but he's much more than Beyond Enterprises. And James Happ from PAL Capital. Uh, I'll let him explain where the PAL came from. I've gotten to know him recently, but he's, again, very warm guy, very in tune with the markets, very good, I think, with finding and mentoring investment opportunities. And beyond that, I'm going to stop because I don't want to steal all of their thunder. Um, let's just kind of, Brad, I, I always like to say, I want to hear the Brad origin story, like the movie Wolverine, like a Marvel Comics movie. Tell us, tell us about Brad. And this is the highest energy show in crypto, by the way. Brad. <laughs> thank, thank you for having me. Um, I'll, I'll do a quick origin story because I don't want to take too much of the show's time. But um, I uh, started programming at a really early age, uh, six, six years old, and started uh, selling the software that I wrote when I was nine. And, and exited that company when I was 15. So uh, my lifelong journey with technology and, and um, building stuff started really early. And uh, it's been a phenomenal journey. Um, fast forward, I uh, got involved with Bitcoin really early, just haphazardly. Someone sent me three files, said Brad compiled these uh, in 2019. One was a command line wallet, the other one was a miner, and the other one was a full node. So again, uh, I already had a lot of interest in cryptography and, and, and um, things of that nature, just because of my uh, passion for software and hardware. And in um, 
got involved with Bitcoin, then Litecoin, Mastercoin, Ethereum, and, and the journey continues. In uh, 2012, we started uh, Beyond Enterprises as a strategic advisory firm. Uh, and in 2016, decided that um, the whole focus should be blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies because the market grew, there were enough projects. And, and that brings us to today, uh, have been a part of some very interesting blockchain projects, very big ones, smaller ones, um, done over probably 60 now uh, as, oh. as, a, as a partner. Mm -hmm. And, and I am an active investor in the space. I've been investing for maybe two decades now, um, more actively uh, recently than, than before, but um, been an angel investor, been a VC, both on the GP and the LP side. And, and again, uh, narrowed the investment focus to blockchain and crypto technologies too in the last four years. And that's been uh, very rewarding uh, amid all the chaos and crypto winter and everything else. So um, big supporter of the ecosystem and, and uh, passionate about hardware and software. That's and that, that is a Bitcoin piece of art behind you, yes? Yes, that is correct. Okay, good. Just want to make sure. I, I collect Bitcoin art. You do? And, and yes. Bitcoin, I believe. So. Uh, yes, that too. Okay, awesome. And I, I, th I think you... I'm going to give you a little bit more credit and say, I, th I think you skipped over saying this when we roll on for today's conversation, which is before you got into crypto and blockchain, you did do. Yes, you, you are. Kickstarter, you think. are correct. I'm, I'm probably very, one of the very few people in this space who's done a traditional IPO on, on NASDAQ and on, on New York Stock Exchange, who's done um, all the regulation exemptions, Reg A, Reg A plus, Reg CF, um, obviously Reg D, uh, because of all the angel investment. But sure. um, I do have a lot of uh, experience in capital formation. I also didn't talk about my education, but I, I studied economics and finance. So I'm a banker by trade. It's our family business too. So um, I, I understand how capital formation works, how markets work, and, and try to bring that experience and uh, perspective into the nascent field of um, crypto and, and digital companies, assets, things like that. Love it. Okay, fantastic. Uh, James, my friend. Uh, fantastic. Thank we'll, you for we'll having me. Origin story, my friend, including Pal. Oh my God! Thank you for having me. And uh, and after that intro, I'm not. I, I think I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Um, of course so, you are. So um, you're on the show. You're worthy. Just so you know, you can feel good for the rest of your life. I finally, I finally found a home. Yes. Um, so uh, my name's James Haft. I'm the founder of Pal Capital. Pal Capital, just to briefly stick it in there for Gordon, it uh, stands for Pacific Alliance Limited because it was formed in 1996 to work as a bridge between the emerging markets of Asia and the United States. Um, it's now turned into a different model, but that's okay. We'll talk about that. So I'm a recovering, I'm a recovering investment banker. Um, I started in, uh, at Bear Stearns uh, for my first 10 years of my career, where I ended up uh, running Asia and uh, being part of the a managing director in the, in the emerging markets investment banking area. Um, and I was lucky enough to be responsible for taking public the first company in China to list on the New York Stock Exchange. So uh, for the last, so I was in, in, uh, in, uh, in Asia, and then I was in Latin America at ING Bearings doing Latin American equity capital markets. So I've taken public uh, a couple hundred companies over, over the period that I was at, at, at major investment banks, always focused on emerging markets, always focused on finding ways to, to, to create liquidity for interesting blue ocean opportunities where the global capital markets were looking for opportunity for, for alpha uh, and for high beta. Uh, but we're not able to, and there was no precedent. So, you know, able to take advantage of my, of my severe ADD uh, by working on transactions that had no precedent. So I didn't have to read all those boring previous documents. Um, and so what, what I would do is basically tokenize uh, the opportunities that were global and put them into a new form where they would, the new form would actually be something which was acceptable and understandable by the uh, first world um, capital market systems. So for instance, in Asia, hmm. the problem was that China was essentially 
at worse at odds than they are today uh, with the United States. And it was actually illegal for an American to hold assets in China, and it was illegal in China to have an American shareholder. Um, so what I did was I took the Chinese assets and I put the, the ownership, the, the, the joint stock uh, ish, certificates into uh, trusts in the BVI and the Cayman Islands, and then took public the trust out of the Cayman Island, the BVI, which was a legal entity, mm -hmm. essentially had tokenized the foreign asset and made it available for the New York Stock Exchange. Um, so I did that for about 10 years. Uh, and in about 1996, I realized that the emerging market I really cared about was the digitization of information, not uh, geographically focused anymore. And I felt that the cha world was changing, that everything was being digitized, uh, and that the, the, the biggest change that was going to happen in the world during my lifetime was going to be the digitization of information and how it impacts politics, society, the economy, religion, education. Um, and so I changed Sorry, the business. James, I, I got to jump in there because you, you actually touched a subject that's bizarrely close to my heart. Did you say religion in there? Religion. I mean, I mean, because the whole key here is, is we're going to get to it, is, is decentralization. But the, the, everything is always defined by its opposite. So the way that, that centralized power has impacted humanity has been positive in certain ways over time. But I think we've reached past the point of diminishing returns. Uh, and now what we are is that, that that centralization is choking us and hurting us because of the way it's balkanizing us and causing tribes. And religion is a perfect example. It tends to be that in our lives, the things that we experience are fractals of the other things that we experience. So what's happening in education is similar to what's happening in religion, is similar to what's happening in politics. And so th that effect of centralization is crushing us as individuals and forcing the systems to try and, uh, and create the reason for their own existence. Uh, and by doing that, they're forcing you to act, to behave in a way that serves the system, but not necessarily your individual be benefit. And that's really the can change. I, can I pass one second? You, you've done something awesome, which is you've introduced a thought in my mind that has never been there before, which is the de when you combine decentralization and religion, you're right, you may, make, you may get a new thing, just like when you combine entities with blockchain, you get DAOs. And right. ma maybe this can be yet another reformation. Well, remember, I've never religion, thought that before. That's fascinating. Religion, that is re religion is really about society, politics, and power, right? So um, that, that's, that's, that's the origin. <laughs> so well, don't, don't quote me on that one. Oh, oops. Yeah, I, um, I so, so, so I, so I formed, so I formed Pal Capital in 1996 to focus on the impact that digitization was going to happen on business uh, and to work with those businesses to create liquidity strategies and uh, that around, uh, you know, around these new, uh, that would businesses that would take advantage of, the, of these, of this digitization. Um, I realized pretty quickly that the real uh, power in these new systems was going to be community, right? We already had uh, cell phone systems and cable network operators and pager systems, which were being valued as POPs, you know, the number of, of, of participants they had in their network. And I started to look at network effects and, and how things were valued. And I started to realize that the real value was going to be in the future was going to be people that supported and participated in the system, like the matrix, we're the battery, yeah. right? Uh, and so, um, so uh, I started to, to understand that, that the, the key really was to believe in community and to believe in people and their passion. Um, and so I started to focus on, uh, on businesses that more and more that, that focused around community. In, 19, uh, in 2010, I formed the largest accelerator in Latin America called NXTP Labs, which is now backed by the World Bank because we were the largest community of entrepreneurs in Latin America. We've now funded over 250 companies in Latin America. We're now heavily focused towards blockchain, who would have thought? So mm -hmm. to cut, uh, cut through a whole bunch of uh, things that happened between uh, then and the last five years, uh, five years ago, I realized that you know uh, my studying of Neil Stevenson was bearing fruit and that the world was starting to look more and more like Neil Stevenson had promoted in his book, Snow Crash, mm -hmm. uh, and that we would start to be connected globally by omnipresent bandwidth, uh, and that we would have avatars that represent wallets, which are algorithmically driven, that would enable us to perform many tasks at the same time and lay many of those off to algorithms that would actually be able to moment by moment uh, optimize for us without wasting our brain cycles. Uh, and so I started to look, and then I looked at his concept of money that would become global and, and, uh, and stateless. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, I started to focus exclusively on blockchain in, uh, or I like to call it distributed ledger because I think it's bigger than blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in about five years ago. About three years ago, I founded 
Crypto or uh, Crypto Mondays uh, with Luke Herner. Uh, Crypto Mondays is, you know, the largest decentralized meetup uh, concept globally ar around crypto. It's so decentralized that I have no idea how big it is now. But when, but when we, when, when I, last time I counted, we were in about 60, 60 cities and 25 countries with about 25,000 members. Uh, wow. But it's, but it's a decentralized organization uh, where it's essentially owned by the local communities and then forms a global brotherhood of people that help each other and stay in communication. Um, and I formed Crypto Oracle, which was meant to be the first fully tokenized fund focusing on distributed ledger assets. Uh, I stopped that activity because, the, because we were trying to do it within the legal structure that existed three years ago, which was non-existent and confusing. Um, and Pause for a second, because uh, again, I reserve the right to completely interrupt yep. at any time during this show. You, you, there was no legal structure that was accommodating to Crypto Mondays. Did I hear that correctly? No, no, to, to Crypto Oracle. So, so the idea oh, of- No, the a, Oracle, the fund. Got it. Okay, I, 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 I'm a believer that liquidity is what drives markets. You, you can focus on people, you can focus on everything else, but if you can't sell what you have, then it's not of value. Okay, thank you. Um, and and so to me, liquidity is is the is the is the single defining element between all successful inv investments. Okay. Um, and, and so uh, I was focusing on cre creating a liquid market that would be permanent capital where people could trade daily in their interest in the most interesting distributed ledger opportunities uh, while, uh, while I had permanent capital so I wouldn't have to match the tenor uh, or terms of my investments against the desires of my investors to get back their capital. Yeah. Hey, uh, um, Zoom admin, do me a favor, just mute yourself. I let you in there even though I don't know you, so don't make me regret it. Nice avatar. Cool uh, avatars, man. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so, um, so basically, uh, the legal structure didn't work. And, you know, hey, buddy, you're, you're not the first one to try to Zoom bomb, but we'll, we'll take you out if we need to. So just mute yourself. Um, so uh, so I'm basically... I'm fucking nigger. I'm nigger. Oh, uh, you are something. Bye. Miss you. Sorry. Exactly. I'm nigger. I'm nigger. Uh, no doubt. You have an accent. Okay. I'm black mamba. I'm black mamba. I think you're overestimating your quad characteristics by a lot. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I think I got the ones for the moment. So okay. again, global IQ seems to be dropping. Quiet on Go the ahead. Set. Get up. Get up. <laughs> All right. So. And now for something completely different. <laughs> it happens. It doesn't matter. Okay, go, exactly. go on. Except on Monty Python, it would be full frontal nudity. So um, <laughs> I've had that happen uh, too. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so I realized the legal structure didn't work, in the, and you know, and and, so I, and I came up with one of my core concepts for what we're doing now, which is that you have to either decide now to be in the regulated world and com and and comply and Gordon cover your ears. Or you need to never make that first step and focus uh, exclusively on, on being decentralized and stateless. Uh, but you can't be in the gray area between the two. Those people that try and be decentralized but also try and be compliant, they can try, but the expense of being involved in that type of system is so significant uh, that I believe that it's, it's still a significant bar to being successful. Um, and so I've, I've uh, now, decided to look back at my at my history of tokenization and using the public markets. And there's so much capital floating around in the legacy capital markets that has nowhere to go, that has no real alpha, uh, and that's really wandering right now. And I decided to, to tokenize digi digital assets and put them inside a public shell uh, and work and to, to create basically, basically Berkshire Hathaway for the Actually, James, I, I'm going to pause you because that, that was a massive introduction and I want to get all the same information, but I want to get it in like question and answer form. But that, that was just, I, but I am going to leave with this one. Your favorite author is, you've said it several times, but I want everyone to catch it. Neil, 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 easy, Neil Stevenson. Okay. And this is the guy who did Cryptonomicon, yes or not? Yeah, also. yes. But you, you said that Snow... Snow Crash. Snow, Snow Crash was the seminal novel about his vision of the future. God, I've read Cryptonomicon. I got to read Snow Crash now. But I'll, you know what? Let's maybe we'll start building some uh, Amazon affiliate links and make like two dollars off these shows. <laughs> Snow Crash is a much easier read than Cryptonomicon. I, you know, I, I just started. I like to dive into the deep end, apparently, whether I mean to or not. Um, so, just you, you, here's part of the inspiration for the show. Other than the fact I know you guys, I know you're great. The I'm. 
separate from anything I'm doing with the two of you, I'm working, I'm helping a, a client with a seed round. And it's an interesting situation because I'm, I'm dealing with different sort of the way the market is right now. And we're pirouetting between traditional equity and tokens and the DeFi space. And it's like, you know, it's such a blend these days that and such a fast moving situation that it's just really interesting. Like, you know, to James, to your point, you know, to what extent do you comply? To what extent do you document? To what extent do you do an end run around this? You know, what can I advise as a US based lawyer versus, you know, can I serve my client by saying, don't talk to me, go just go do it and tell me about it later. It's always, it's always a blend of facets. And what's interesting about you two is you didn't just show up last year and go, oh, wow, crypto is neat. I'm an, I'm an IC, you know, I don't, I don't know if you know, guys know the, the number of ICO advisors on LinkedIn about two or three years ago proliferated like crazy. And if you look at their history, it's like before it was like janitor or something. Um, so, and then I, you know, I went on TechCrunch, I went on the website. There's a lot of VC funding still happening. There's a lot of announced ABC rounds. There's a lot of the seed rounds being announced. I, 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 I take issue with what I think I've heard some people say that traditional fundraising is dead. I, don't know if it's dead, dying, turning to a hybrid, or it's just going to operate in a different lane. So I, I think I think I like no, both no, you to no, it's, go, it's, go ahead. It's more, it's, it's more like it's not dead yet; it's just a flesh wound. Well, <laughs> I, okay. The <laughs> thanks, Richard. Yes, I am awake. You know, coffee helps. Um, well, I, I guess you know. Let, let's start off with that relative softball and take the question seriously. It is traditional fundraising, the rounds, the venture capitals, is that model dead or is it going to a cul-de-sac or how do you see it? And that, let me switch back to Brad, just because we had a bunch of James there, but then James, we're gonna switch right back to you. Brad, what's your what's your feeling? Um, I, I don't think it's dead. I think, um, so initially the, everything that involves crypto, whether it be ICOs, TGs, um, evolved around, um, technologists solving the issues that they were experiencing. They weren't necessarily um, addressing the larger uh, venture capital industry-wide issues that, that can be solved with uh, distributed ledgers and, and crypto. So, so I think it's evolving where I, I can see a future where we still have um, the traditional models of fundraising, but using the technology that the ICOs and the TGEs use. So, so a hybrid, I think, is going to be in our near and far future. How far we go into the decentralized technology side and how far uh, we, we, we stay in the pen and paper, you know, um, safts and, and, and agreements and wire transfers, that's just going to depend on the, the risk appetite of traditional investors. But we're seeing that change as we speak now. I mean, JP Morgan from two years ago, we're saying Bitcoin is the devil and, you know, everyone's going to lose their money to today or like a week ago saying 5% of your portfolio should be Bitcoin. That's a, that's a huge mental evolution that I think uh, all of the investors in the private space and the hedge fund space, even in the institutional and family office spaces mm -hmm. are going through. I, I spoke at uh, one of the largest family office gatherings last year um, and, and no one had invested in crypto yet there may be one family that had some exposure to crypto, but these are, you know, big family offices, oil and gas, transportation, like infrastructure kind of businesses. Mm -hmm. And, and everyone was trying to figure out how uh, this is going to affect their business. So as more and more people um, get more comfortable with the idea that you can do your fundraising online and you can do it uh, with crypto and still be compliant and still uh, get the same results or better results faster. I think it's going to evolve into a hybrid model where every type of fundraising is going to have a, um, a token component, a distributed ledger component, something that uses uh, blockchain. So let me, let me kind of jump in there. So when, you know, when, when, C, when angels and especially, and Brad, we talked about this, when angels and especially VCs come in, 
especially VCs, their preferred mode of going into a company is with preferred stock. And it's not, as I like to say, it's not your grandfather's preferred stock. It has all sorts of rights associated with it. The preemptive rights, the anti-dilution provisions, all this annoying 100 page stuff. And just for fun, I went through the new versions of the National Venture Capital Association's transaction documents and the binder for, for, for that is this. This is my bedtime reading. And as paper heavy and as annoying and as intricate as that stuff is, it all did serve a purpose, at least in the, the minds of the people doing it. And it was sort of based on experience, lawyers anticipating, but also different scenarios. Does that kind of stuff need to be translated over into smart contract land, into token land? Does it fall by the wayside? Are those lessons lost or they're telling you, is it something that's gonna to try to transmute into this new mold? Put it in the time I think, Say again? I think, I think it, is gonna, it is gonna turn into a, a programmatic approach. And I don't know how much of it will transfer over, but, uh, but I think um, you know, there's, there's no reason why some of those expectations, whether it's a legal framework or just the agreement um, you know, the preferences of the pref preferred stock, right. all those things can be programmatically uh, built into the fundraise. So I think instead of reading a hundred page, um, you know, PPM in the future, you're just going to see the highlights of what the contract is, but there's going to be a hundred pages of programming behind it to, to ensure that all the token holders are compliant, all the stakeholders are compliant. Um, yeah, James, go ahead. I think you should take that binder and put it in the time capsule uh, so, that, so that when future aliens visit and they find it, that they will have something to do before they go to sleep. Um, the, uh, the, the, the concepts in there, there are some, as I agree with Brad, that will, that will survive that are you know, basically fundamental to understandings between humans. Uh, but most of the document in the, that you have there uh, serves the purpose of employing the lawyers and the regulators, uh, and not actually not actually the participants <coughs> in the transaction. Um, and, now, and now I James, think, are you are you being like a Che Guevara type firebrand when you say that? Is that like like your actual you actual know, opinion, or is that to be provocative? Well, you know, I have a philosophical bent to most of what I do, um, mm. and I think that there's a couple things that that are that are endemic to humans. The first is that we tend to reverse the causal arrow. Uh, and so when you listen to people's uh, descriptions of things, a lot of times they're confusing what is with what has to be uh, and, and, and how they got and how things got there. Uh, and so the history of those documents, you know, are not really around the needs of the end participants. Um, and and, uh, and the, uh, you know, the other thing that I, that I believe is that people decide what they want to do uh, and then make up the reason afterwards uh, as justifications uh, so that most decisions actually get made on gut. Uh, not on logic, um, and so uh, when I look at the you know at the business dealings of the future, right now it's interesting. So you know everyone thinks that we're way further ahead in the digitization of the world and 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 in the use of crypto and uh, in distributed ledger replacing you know uh, double entry accounting etc. Uh, for the for the, for for accounting and 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 movement of information and value, uh, but we're really nowhere. We're in the middle of the first inning. So for instance, you know digital tokens, digi digital securities, tokenization of securities, et cetera. Um, you know, I think that every security obviously is gonna be digitized in the future. Uh, however, and, and I'm also one of the people that curates some of the largest conferences around uh, digital securities and, and, mm -hmm. and how that's gonna work. However, if you asked me what I think of digital, of, you know, of tokenized securities right now and, and these digital security markets that are not the main markets, I would tell you, that it's actually not a good idea right now as the company or the entrepreneur to look at those markets. Because one of the things I've learned over the last 30 years is the market is never wrong. By definition, the market is the market and is right. And right now, if you put out a deal which is tokenized security and you put it next to a, a legacy documented transaction, you will pay, you will uh, basically get a discount in your valuation for the digitized so, uh, tokenized transaction. Uh, and the reason for that is the market doesn't want it yet. It doesn't understand it. And the major holders of, of liquid assets don't understand how to, to invest in it legally, how to pay the taxes uh, and how to deal with liquidity. 
yet. So right now the market is telling you that it doesn't want those, uh, those assets yet. Doesn't mean it's not coming, doesn't mean it's not the future. It just means in today's market, you're still at a point where you're advantaged and have a bigger market to sell to if you're doing a legacy transaction. Uh, and that's let, let, let me ask you a question there. Is there any, I think part of the attraction of ICOs and tokens was at least while the regulators were not looking too closely, you could go international with your sale and maybe more broad based with yourself, you sort of get out of it, the credit investor bubble than you could with traditional investments. I don't know to what extent that's still true. And I'd like to get your thought. Well, you have to remember at the height of the ICO boom, when it was obvious that 90% plus of transactions were, forget if they were fraud or not, were just never gonna be anything. And you were essentially shoveling your money down a black hole hoping to get a return, uh, that that's when the activity and the demand was the highest, mm. right? So the idea that the regulators are protecting you is, I think, complete hogwash. Uh, and, that, and, the, and the way that the US uh, markets and the people, that, the country that co copy the US, they, mis they mistakenly uh, 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 value intelligence, uh, um, wealth, as being a, a, a stand-in for intelligence. So in order to make a good decision and to protect yourself, you need to be wealthy. Uh, and that's actually A, wrong, uh, and also B, very dangerous and uh, negative for society because it actually limits social and economic um, uh, portability of individuals, right? Because what you're saying is if you're a day worker and you're not wealthy, then you can only make money by, by, by employing your hours and receiving payment for your hours. You can't make bets based on capital. So therefore, it's almost impossible for you to break out of your current caste, yes. right? Uh, and so to say that a day worker is a day worker and is not smart enough to protect himself from the risks of making investments with his capital is a huge jump that really has nothing to, no scientific backing. And so I'm, I'm going to go one step further. I agree with you 100%, James. And I'm going to go one step further and say it's a control mechanism. It has nothing to do with protecting people, helping people, helping companies, protecting, nothing to do with it. Everything, every regulation around investment that's based on some level of wealth or the, whatever the current structures are elsewhere is to control the flow of money. And that's, that's it. The government can give exemptions to any project they deem. They can make direct investments into it. Uh, Incutel comes to mind for certain projects. And, and you know, there's, there, there are no restrictions there. But when it comes to someone, uh, you know, who's, uh, who's not even a day worker, I mean, it could be some white collar, highly high earning hourly employee but if you make hundred and ninety five thousand dollars in us you're not allowed to make angel investments where what does that last five thousand dollars bring you in experience and knowledge that you don't get with hundred and ninety five it's it's archaic and asinine and again i i believe firmly believe it's just a control mechanism it doesn't have anyone's best interest in mind the companies or the investors complete 100 com percent completely agree um and, and uh so and so to go back to the point about the icos the, the market demand was at its highest when the regulators came in to protect us right um and, and mm. so uh so what you're seeing now in terms of the decentralized exchanges and these uh and you know, and and the lit, the direct listings onto these dexes, uh, you know, is just the uh, the continuation of hu global humanity's desire to participate in uh, in capital formation uh, and the and the uh, progression of digitization of information and, and the opportunities that are being created cross border, uh, and it's you know represents the weakening of the current systems of uh, you know of regulation and control. Actually, we got a really, uh, Xavier, um, I'm, I'm gonna have Xavier join the conversation actually to ask a few questions, but Mark Moores, if I'm saying his name correctly, made a really interesting point in the chat. We have a pretty active chat this morning. It says, our project has only sold shares in the company, no ICO, and in fact, our company doesn't own any of the coin. It just receives a separate revenue stream from the project. From the project. ICOs are too expensive to do legally in most territories, if you're trying to effectively bootstrap. 
So I, I'm not going to give my point of view on that. I, I want to hear Brad and James, your points of view on that. And, and, and sorry, and he adds in there, and we only sold shares to friends and family. That makes total sense to me, uh, at, because what 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 uh, what Mark's company has done, uh, project has done, is take advantage of each of the silos in the ways they can best be leveraged. They went to the family offices and said, "I have a company, and here's my business model." And then they created a separate economy in the token and created a profit model for the business based on the token economy, uh, and, and where where people can behave in the in the tokenized world as as they see fit. And I think that that's. A good that's a that's a perfectly good model, uh, and I think that model actually is going to survive for a while. Uh, you know, a, as a hybrid uh, where people can focus, because there are people that need to be uh, within the law. They have assets and physical presence, uh, and you know, and fear, uh, you know, that so that they or 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 take advantage of the existing system, so that so that's necessary to find ways to do that. And I think hybrid models like that are uh, you know are going to be. Uh, prev uh, you know, growing over over time, and I can point to many companies that have tried similar, uh, you know, similar similar uh, concepts. And, and David Judson, I, I'm going to bring you in, and Mark, I'm going to actually bring you in live reasonably soon because I want you to. And Richard Ross, good to see you. I think I'm going to bring you guys live in to this conversation. Just bear with us. Um, Brad, can you respond to Mark's point in the most recent chat? Um, I, I think I agree with him that if if you don't choose your jurisdiction um, at the beginning correctly, and sometimes it's not an option if you're in a regulated uh, industry to to be abroad and choose your jurisdiction to as you please to your whim. Um, I, I I think yes, the the ICOs can be very expensive to do. Uh, in, in a compliant manner, and and you you know that as an attorney because that's a that's a big uh, line item there, the legal compliance part of it. Um, I, I I think I agree again. Um, you know, with the approach that sometimes as long as all the stakeholders are um, recognized and, and compensated in a fair way, sometimes it is strategic to use both systems, but use them in a different way. So do your fundraising with a traditional uh, model and, and, you know, sell equity and then use your tokens to fuel your internal economy and draw some economic benefit from that into the company. And the company may or may not own the tokens. It may or may not be a DAO. Those are obviously choices you make based on your business model and industry. But uh, at the end of the day, the, the biggest failure in those hybrid models that I've seen is, uh, is when people forget about one group of stakeholders and create this uh, ecosystem, their tokenomics and everything one-sided, lopsided. So only the equity holders benefit from the economic activity or all, only the token holders benefit from economic activity and it creates uh, uh, an unbalanced uh, ecosystem. Interesting. You know, we're, we're having fantastic chat conversations including from people I know. So guys, just, just hold tight. I'm gonna bring you in live. When I get a chance, David, if you can fix your microphone, I'd love to have you in here, but I know I know you're dealing with a tech issue. Xavier, um, I'm going to break protocol and bring in one of our alumni speakers early just because I know he has good questions to ask on this. And you know what? I'd like to, I'm going to get myself some more coffee for a second while he's asking. Xavier, are you there? Are you live? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. So I, I'm actually going to stand up and get some coffee. I'll be back in two seconds, okay. but, but launch. Go for it. James, Brad, I am... So happy that you're here. This is a great conversation. And ideologically, we are like all aligned here. You, you've been talking about um, the need for, you know, obviously decentralization and the, the fact that people want to be free and be able to increase their capital holdings and their, and their personal freedom, which is the whole basis for Firon. Um, the model that we're using is basically we're selling equity, traditional equity, but also have a token uh, involved, right? So let's say it, it disrupts the capital markets or the, the private family offices in the way where let's say uh, they want traditional equity, they can get traditional equity. And if the, the, um, the person who's making the choices, the, they get to keep the tokens, let's say, and then give the equity to the family, right? Because they just want a traditional equity raise or whatever. So it's sort of like this blended thing. Do you think that this is a good workaround or is it more um, you do an equity round and then you do a token round as well? 
and set that up like offshore, let's say, with, with like US block and, and China block. If I could jump in a second. Um, first of all, I have a big feel, you know, theory about fractals that it's all the same stuff happening over and over again. And we're just, yeah. you know, different forms, digitization makes it look a little different, but it's not really any different. Human needs are human needs and human activities haven't really changed over the last couple hundred years. Um, so uh, so uh, what you're really looking at is very similar to what's happening in the SPAC market. Like the SPAC market was that they wanted to do blind pools. And then the government said, you can't do blind pools because the promoters are stealing all the money. So right. you have to say something. So they started to say something and the government said, well, that's not saying enough. So they started to say more. And then the government said, you have to give a little control. So they gave a little control. Then the government said, you have to give a lot of control. So they're giving a lot of control, right? And that's now morphed into a specific form where you raise the money, you can use 10% to try and, uh, you know, to try and do the deal. And so what the market did was found an answer, which is they gave 15% of the deal as warrants and 85% of the deal as equity. And then you issue it to, uh, to, uh, to institutions who take it in and sell the warrants immediately, get back 15% of the money and know that the worst they can lose is 10% unless they vote yes for the deal. So they actually have the deal by the throat, right? Uh, and so you're kind of announced, talking about the same kind of concept where you push the asset out in a way that's already pre-scored to be separated and divided, uh, and then allow the market to put the pieces that fit best with each of you know with each of the investor classes, so that you can match needs with asset best. So so you're so, th so there's already precedent for what you're talking about in terms of from the economic perspective. From the legal perspective, I still think it's problematic. I mean, Gordon is going to say to you that there's legal ways to do ICOs, that we've gotten you know, no action letters from the government, blah, blah, blah. But the truth is the government is capricious and can do whatever the hell it wants. And the right. reality is, is that no real government has actually said that they approve of digital assets or, you know, or things to do with, with DLT. They've given provisional, yes, it's OK, I won't put you in jail yet. Right, but they yeah. haven't really authorized the way. You can't go to you can't go to Scadden Arps and get a clean opinion letter on a DLT deal right now, right? right so and, I, I'm going to jump in. You definitely can't get it from Scadden, but you can get it from right. local Swiss right, law but firms. That, but, but 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 you know the major global institutions they want Scadden and and you know and and DLA Piper, and they want the mm -hmm. big guys. Because because what because what, when you do a deal in the legacy world, you didn't actually do your due diligence. No one actually reads the documents. You went and said, "Do I have do I have the insurance policy of a major four accounting yeah. firm on the line? Do I have the do I have the malpractice of a major law firm that's millions of dollars? And so if I'm wrong, I have idiot insurance, and I could just turn around and sue them because they gave me a three sentence letter which said this deal is clean." And you can't get that letter right now for a tokenized transaction. And until you can, you can't really access the major financial markets. So we're still in a gray area as much as we want to be told. The lawyers, and except for Gordon, of course, uh, the lawyers are basically trying to force, remember what I said at the beginning, that, that the existing power structure is trying to force our activity into their uh, template so that they can do what they want to do and therefore we need to behave in the way that supports their activity so that's so what's what the workaround that's what the legal community is doing that's what the banking community is doing that's what the accounting community is doing and that's what the government is doing right and so what you're talking about in terms of moving into this decentralized world is to find a way where we're existing on a different plane where it's fine, where, it's, where the government has trouble finding the touch point, the anchor point to, to, to pursue you. And yes, Gordon, they'll always have the ability to corporally go after me personally. That's true, but we can work on that as well. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but so to answer your question, Xavier, the answer is yes, it makes sense. It's been done. It fits into the pattern of how capital markets work. But no, legally, I don't think it offers you the protection you're looking for because you still have that touch point where they can form a nexus and go after you. And jurisdiction is about finding a nexus, right? Whether it's physical you know, or, or, or economic, et cetera. Uh, and so I think that those are interesting workarounds to satisfy these intermediaries who need you to act in a certain way, but I'm not sure they actually serve your purpose. And I'm not sure you have the protection that you want. That's the reason you're going through that process. Yeah, the protection is not uh, a super high concern. You know, jurisdictionally, corporally, it's a, it's it, it make you can make it harder for them to quote unquote get you if you can run out past the boundary far enough. 
establish a flag and make it secure enough, you know, there, there's there's a, a, an argument to be made for that. I'm looking for what is the quickest, fastest, and most secure uh, way to go beyond the boundary, establish that flag, and kind of defend it, let's say. Brad, I'm, Brad, Brad, Brad I'm, I'm monopolizing, and I hate, I hate when I do that. So you want to jump in? No, no, you're not. It's It was spot on. I mean, <clears throat> I, I, I think it depends on the... Uh, again, it depends on the circumstances of your business and, and your jurisdiction. Um, I, I agree with James um, to an extent that there is nowhere in the world right now where you can hide from U.S. government. Um, so th unless you, you're operating out of North Korea or, or uh, Somalia or, or somewhere and there they just take military action if, if you go to those places. Um, there, there's no, you know, running out of the range and planting a flag, at least as far as the U.S. government is concerned. So I, I think that analogy, you know, puts you in a precarious situation where you're thinking I can outrun a certain government and, and you know, uh, create my own safe, safe. Well, harbor. no, let's say you had the tacit complicity of elements within the U.S. government who wanted to see how this development would unfold in a sandbox. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't work. So, so, so the premise of that sentence just doesn't work, right? The tacit complicity means you're depending on an individual who may or may not be there, right? And, and, and on documents that you can't rely on. Uh, so I think you need to look at it from a different perspective. And that is when you're selling, selling is about listening right, and about delivering what people want and desire. Uh, and so the reason you would do the kind of structure you're talking about, and I think that was it Mark or, or, or Richard was asked about previously, is because that's what the buyer wants. Because they've convinced themselves in, from their perspective and their belt and schlong that they believe that, that, the, that, that these things are better for them, that, these, that those types of structures fit within their understanding and their comfort zone. And so therefore they'd be willing to invest. Right. Uh, and so uh, and so from that perspective, you know, you're not being asked to be, you know, to 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 to, to know more than they are. They have formed their own worldview and you're giving them back the, the Lego block that fits into their wall. Right. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, I do think that that's an opportunity and a growing market right now of people who want to get involved, but aren't really comfortable with, you know, with with specifics, but can gloss over enough. Uh, to, to accept the type of structure. And again, that's what I'm doing right now is I have a public company in Norway that I'm the largest shareholder. I'm folding in DLT assets and, and a significant uh, ownership in an in a, in a interesting uh, Bitcoin mining facility. And I'm going to generate cash flow and, re, and reinvest into DLT assets and offer that where you can type in three letters, uh, you know, into your browser and buy stock with, you know, as any, uh, any institution or retail investor globally. I'm going to try and become Berkshire Hathaway for the DLT market, where you don't have to know wallets, you don't have the legal structure, you don't have to worry about taxation, you don't have to worry about private keys, etc. If you want to be involved in this new, in the rising ocean of digitization of information and crypto as it relates to, you know, to to to, to capital formation, you know, buy my stock, buy Element. You know, James, let me pause for one second. We have an alumni speaker, uh, Didi Taihutu. I always wonder if I'm saying his name correctly. You know him. He's the wild man. He, like I always say, he's the man who read the four hour work week and actually made it work. Uh, Didi, since you got, yeah, you're, you're pulling that, I only have 10 minutes, boy, and I'm falling for it, but it's okay. I want to get you so in here. Can, can you <laughs> assault Brad and really, James with some pointed questions, Che, che, che Guevara? Um, you know, no, no I, I'm just really enjoying the show. Uh, Brad, I love uh, the Bitcoin art piece on the wall on the back of you. Um, send it over to me. <laughs> it's a beautiful one. No, man, I, I really love the, uh, the whole conversation, but I think the whole conversation um, should start on a much deeper level in humanity, because as long we people live in fear and greed, uh, all the solutions and all the things we create uh, will be for nothing. Uh, we can see that humanity is driven by fear and greed, and we can see how the governments are controlling it through the whole finance game onto the flu now, and that we live in fear and greed, and that's why we just accept everything they do. And I think as long as the mentality of human beings will be living in fear and greed, that whatever um, new concept we will create, 
decentralized world, the ones I am creating as well in Thailand, House of Dao in Bulgaria, Blockchain Valley, the, mm. the long people are not there yet. We cannot force them into these places. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to jump in. Didi, for, for these projects you're setting up, that requires resources. How are you, how are you making that happen? It's, it's a community driven uh, process. So we are building House of DAOs, decentralized on autonomous or, uh, organizations, where as a community, you need to start from the beginning. You know, I've been living as a digital nomad now for many years. Many people I met, they want to build a community by just opening a hotel and then just buy people in. Mm -hmm. That's not how you build a new world. That's not how you build a new mentality. That's not how you build a new, new ecosystem. You build it to start with a group of people and this group of people need to naturally grow into a community and then mm. the bigger the community becomes the more power the community gets but as long and as also we... it doesn't mean that building a community doesn't require physical proximity i i feel like i'm connected to a lot of people across the globe and we may not even see each other physically like this year at all but I still feel like I'm a part of that community and vice versa. So it's, it starts up here and then grows yeah. from there, not getting a hotel, getting a piece of land and saying, oh, this is whatever. Um, there, 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 there is something to build it and first, they will come. My first, my first disagreement with Brad. Um, so I, yeah. I love physical, I, I love physical proximity and I, and I, and I, I think there's incredible value from the sparks that come from looking in someone's eye. However, absolutely. However, I've been living in Vermont in the mountains since February. I haven't left the state. Okay. Um, I am doing some of the most exciting deals that I've ever done in my life, which are representations and embodiments of all the things that we're talking about right here with people that I've never met physically. I've never met Gordon. Physically, he, he, Gordon's my friend now. We met through s yeah. several different things we're doing together, and we're friends now. You know, he's my buddy, and we've never been in the same room together. We probably have been in the same room for Crypto Monday or for some LA conference, but you know, we kind of looked at each other and laughed and walked away. Uh, so you know, <laughs> so you remember that <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. But, but, yeah. so, so so but but totally backing what Didi was saying, which is it's all about community. The value in in these in these new businesses is the community so uh just to go back to you know uh education which uh you know since mm -hmm. uh um it was brought up earlier by brad i'm an art history major with a with you know a double major where, where the other part was marxist economics all right so art history and marxist economics i i did some basic programming when i was younger but i've never really programmed anything and i've been investing in the space for 25 years in advising businesses right and the, what i've learned is that it's not about the technology, right? And it's not even about management or whatever, that, that's, although that's important, right? Um, the, the reality is the, man, the, the, the technology is binary. It either works or it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, who cares, right? Because it doesn't work. If it works, it's still who cares, right? Because technology without users is useless, right? And, and so what's really important is you know, what kind of community can you develop? Can you habituate activity, whether it's by computers or individuals, mm -hmm. through your platform, through your software that breathes life and value into it? And so at the end of the day, the thing that has value is the community. And the thing that's beautiful about crypto is the ability to build communities and to parse the compensation and incentives in ways that can be tailor-made to the different participants to breathe life into ecosystems to have them become self-sustaining. And that's what I believe is beautiful about, about the crypto and the distributed ledger. Not, I don't think distributed ledger is beautiful. I think that it's the veins that allow and the, and the, and the, and the, and the uh, nervous system that enables us to breathe life into clay. Um, and, that, and that enables us to empower these communities that already exist. Humanity wants to get together. Humanity wants to collect with like minds on like projects and they want to do it globally. And humanity doesn't really care what your color, race, religion or sexual preference is, right? What it cares about is, are you passionate about the same thing I'm passionate or do you have the same need that I have, right? And how do we interact and do this? And that's what's being unlocked. And that's why this is the next turn of the of the revolutions and evolutions that create us to create more and more value when every time we think we've maxed out we maxed out in the internet so oh my god growth is dead 
But now comes the next level, and we keep surprising. Right, James, James, do, do, do I, not I shoot down this question because I, I feel like you would. I'm, I'm just going to kind of blend DD. I'm going to do a Vulcan mind meld between DD and myself. For the community building process you're talking about, including the organic ones from the ground up, does capital formation play a role? And what does that look like given what you just said? Can you integrate those concepts for me? So first, can you combine it, please, with this question? Because I really need to leave. I mean, we'll watch it afterwards. But I, I get the word really to Go. I, I'm really excited what you're saying. But um, if humanity keeps under control of greed and monetary systems, how can we ever disconnect from this system? The only way I figured out after 20 years of thinking in a hammock and running companies is disconnecting from the system. I am a digital nomad. I'm a bum. I'm a homeless guy with bitcoins. This was the only way for me to escape a system out of control. Nobody can freeze any asset. Nobody can take anything from me. And that is what gives me the freedom to connect to everybody wherever I want in the world. So how can we you know, disconnect the human, humans from this ultimate mindset of greed for money at the same time disrupt the monetary system we are fighting to while that system is making a prison out of the system for them. You know, we all know that step one will be the central bank's digital currencies, step two will be uh, getting cash rid of the countries, and step three will be forcing people in monthly salaries only when they accept central bank's digital currencies, not when they will have Bitcoin. So, so and then the step when everybody is going digital, how do you buy this new system? So Didi, you, uh, we, I, don't know if the, I don't know if you were on for the very beginning of the, of, of the call, but one of the things I said is that, is that you have to make a decision whether you want to be in or out. That if you, if you opt to be in the gray area, you can't really be true to either side, right? Because, uh, because the way the government works is it controls you through the control of currency and telling you how to store it, how to trade it, and how it gets taxed and what you're, el what you're eligible to participate in. And once you give them a point of contact, a bank account, a physical address, right, your social security number, uh, and once you submit yourself to any part of that compliance, you're done. You've anchored yourself to like like anchoring yourself to the Bitcoin blockchain, right? You've mm -hmm. you've anchored yourself there, and you have a point of failure. Um, and so the answer is you need to have uh, either uh, you need to either have a dual life, uh, which one would be the avatar that we talked about earlier from, from Neil Stevenson, and one would be yourself. And in the future, I think you'll move more and more of your value and more important of your important part of your life into that avatar. Now, again, this goes back to fractals. This is what the wealthy have been doing for hundreds of years. This is why Switzerland exists, right? Because Switzerland and Panama and these other places, they gave, they gave the wealthy the ability to have a parallel life, a parallel set of assets that were out of their control and not under mm -hmm. their name. They were in trustee name, right? And so they could, they could avoid taxation and they could shop for jurisdiction. And what DLT is doing and the digital world is doing is giving me the opportunity to have avatars that I can choose the jurisdiction that can behave as they want independently, even though I can pull the strings, just like the wealthy have always, always been able to do. And so I think that that's the transition methodology for people like you. And I think generally for everybody in the future is this democratization of freedom, right? People talk about freedom of speech. The most important illustration of your freedom of speech is money, right? Because mm. you lie about everything, but you won't lie about how you spend your money, right? You're honest with what you wanna do with how you allocate your, your capital. And the government is, is censoring you by telling you how you can hold your money, how you can spend it, you know, and how you can profit from it, right? And That's so, a really interesting way of putting it. So, so, so what controls really on your spending is censorship. That is, that's a fascinating idea. Oh, it's so, harvesting. So, so that's seminal to my whole philosophy of why we're going the direction we're going is because humans want to communicate freely with each other. Mm -hmm. And they have always resented being told how and who to, and what they can say, right? To the point where people are willing to risk death for the, for the right to do that, okay? And this expression of money is no different. And that's why this is natural to, to flow in the direction that we're flowing, which is to become stateless and to do transactions with each other as we please, because that's free will, that's free speech. Fascinating. Didi, I think you should stick around. 
<laughs> oh man, I, 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 already, I am already three minutes late, but- You, 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 you already... just basically need to put this as a recurring, you don't seem like the kind of guy who has Outlook, to be honest, but if you no, have no, Outlook, I mean... make, this a, make this a recurring appointment. And people are used that I'm late. So I will give it another 10 minutes. I will, I already text them. I don't, I'm a little bit later. It's a, it's, like it's a it. meeting. It's, it's a meeting with House of Darwin Thailand where we are talking about exactly this. And, and that's why there is an accelerator uh, project coming out of House of Darwin. Now it's called Paid Network. Um, mm -hmm. Just check it up, paidnetwork.com. And, and that is making a combination of all of this, what we're talking about. Um, because we want to get people out of this system and create an, op an alternative way of living, you know? And I think people are just too much sheeple to think ahead. They need to um, react. They will never anticipate. So if we create an alternative way of living that can grow, then people will understand that they want to be part of that community. Even if it's physical, if it is virtual or whatever way, but we need to create something that, you know, that touches everybody, not just the virtual worlds now where only the kids play with their avatar, but we need to create physical as well for the other generations that, that really still want to, you know, walk uh, on the white. Right, so let, let, Didi, let me, let me address something with, with you directly. And just, you know, I, I love playing devil's advocate, but you know, I, I think I did this with James and Marco when I was talking about evil DAOs and, and you know, what happens if you merge Skynet with a DAO? Let me, let me, let me give you a thought and hopefully we're friends. Skynet after is a DAO. Yeah, that's Brad. That's why you and our buddies. Skynet is a DAO. It's a distributed, yeah, it is. It's a DAO plus also, AI. Also, I, I do want to clarify something because James said, I'm going to disagree with Brad for the first time. <laughs> and, and, then, and then he didn't. And, <laughs> and then he repeated exactly what I said. So I I missed something there, but I no, wanted you're, to You're just a Jedi. That. You know, these were the droids no, he was no, looking no, for. No, there, no, there, was, there, there, was, there, there was a finer point in there, but now I can't even remember what it was. Well, here, <laughs> let, 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 me, let, me, let me hit Didi's point while we got him on, on the call. So Didi. I'm, I'm going to be provocative, okay? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to suggest that fear and greed exist in our collective minds for an evolutionary reason. It's, it's not like the government put that stuff in there. You know, fear and greed are survival instincts, you know, and I'm going to channel uh, Gordon Gecko from Wall Street, and, you know, greed is good. Greed for life, greed for love, greed for happiness. You can substitute in desire, which is a less loaded word, but greed kind of implies the survival aspect of it. fear is useful. I don't want to be eaten by a bear. I don't want to lose all my money. I don't want to have bad relationships. I don't want to get screwed over. Fear is a useful emotional signal when your rational brain doesn't necessarily pick up on something. And I, th I think, I don't know, I don't necessarily want us to get beyond fear and greed. I want us to get above our fear and greed to, you know, just like in a Zen way, be open to all the sense and emotional experience of life, but then kind of channel it through our rational facilities. I am I am not entirely, to be honest, I'm not entirely with you that we can move to this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna mock it slightly, but you know, you can push back, you know, to this Nirvana like plane of, you know, I've now released all my fear and greed and we're beyond. I just don't want the government, I don't want other people to have it over me, but of course that's the nature of fear and greed. You know, you're not fearing greeding against yourself so much. You're not trying to take it from but your left is, pocket I, to your I right think... pocket. So go ahead. I think there is a huge difference um, between fear that is natural, fear mm -hmm. of a tiger. And I'm then even, I don't know if it's like grounded fear because why would we fear a tiger? Because if we shoot him, yeah, he will attack. But if this fear is created by a centralized organization, then we are not talking about natural fear anymore. And this is what we see nowadays in the world. This is not natural fear for a flu to walk around with a face mask. This is created fear. This is pushed onto the people. And when this is being created by centralized organization, this fear, I'm not referring it to fear. This is like oppression. That is like, that is almost like creating prison and slavery again. You know, this is, it's like two different things. I, I of course, I can have, I, I well, okay, but, you know, how, how many people are on the planet? Seven billion? Bear, like, I'm or, losing or track. A snake. Okay, one mm -hmm. more time. Sure. So if fear is natural, because you run into a bear or a lion, you run or you lie down, whatever is the best tactic. That is like natural fear that is built into us evolutionary in the last 13.8 billion years that it took for us to have this chat with each other. Mm -hmm. But if this fear is created out of nothing by a centralized organization, and I'm referring to a government, uh, for example, or the monetary system slash banks because you are afraid of losing money while like 
biggest part of the 13.8 billion years people lived without money, still we are afraid of something that is now being created by a centralized organization. And I was referring to the flu, because why would we fear a flu that we already survived 50 to 100 years? We fear it because a centralized organization is monetizing the fear. And as long that we live in, in greed and fear, this centralized organization that is monetizing the shit out of us, we become assets because of social media, because of all the stuff we, 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 we all every day do. I don't think the, the people's mindset is ready to evolve to this next step of accessing a complete decentralized world. And that's why I think we take it back to the small part where we start small and lead by example and show that it is possible. We, I do. Okay, so hold, on, hold, on, hold on, guys. I got some AK in the chat did something to set me straight, which is he said, "Is there going to be a discussion about raising startup capital today?" Yeah, sorry, I disrupted it again. My, no, 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 uh, no, 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 no. God bless you, no, BD. No, 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 no. Good segue. Okay, it's it's actually a good segue. Brad and James, sorry, sorry, Brad it's, and James. No, it's no, a no. Good segue. BD, good. love you. There's a reason we put you live. Yeah, yeah, it's a good segue actually, because here we are. We're all motivated by the same thing. And what we want to do is we want to build the best kind of structure that provides the enough strength in terms of like uh, corporate structure and corporate design to be able to take that new template that we all want to see happen and give it enough strength and security to last its infancy to build and grow out. And so we're talking about how to raise the capital in that and how to build the company and what the structure is. Go ahead, James. So just again, you got to be careful because language forms how you communicate and is, it wires your brain uh, and forms the templates that people can accept or reject information. The concept of a corporation is a fiction, right? It's a fiction created so that the current legal system could work, right? A corporation is a person under the law uh, and acts as its, own as its own individual actor and can be subject to, uh, you know, to regulation uh, and punishment under the system. That's why corporations exist. Right? We're talking about the next stage of capital formation, uh, which isn't necessarily going to require corporations anymore. We're going to have the same needs of protecting ourselves from the government and from other people in, in prosecuting those desires. Uh, but I think that there's new forms, specifically right now, the flavor of the day is the Dow. Right? Uh, and the Dow may or may not be the last form that humanity finds, uh, you know, depending on how long humanity lasts. Uh, but uh, so, uh, so I hear what you're saying, and I agree. But I would just be careful of the of the of the of the nomenclature, uh, and, you know, and 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 the terms that you use, because a lot of them are formed by the by the uh, legacy system. So totally. let, let me let me we keep on playing off AK's comment. And again, the, the, the subtitle of today's show was 2020 versus 2021. But that actually relates. So that, so that actually, I can segue that into the discussion of raising capital, if you'd like. Yeah, please. Okay. So, so, the, so the, Didi, I love you. Please contact me. And Didi, I, I took you off mute for a reason. So it's okay. We, 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 we can divert the topic for you. But now, now back on. Okay, James, go. It was not my intention, but um, thank Listen, you very love, you, much, love you, love you, love you. Thank you for coming on. Appreciate Peace it. Bye. Peace, love. So, uh, so, uh, so fundraising, you know, exists within this legal world that we're in the corporeal world where we are, uh, and involves activities of human beings, uh, you know, at least for the, for the, for the mean, for the, for the current, in the current reality. Um, and so how you raise money uh, is related to your philosophical belief of control and desire to be compliant to regulatory systems. Um, and so the question of is one better than the other really is a personal question uh, more than a legal question or a, you know, or a philosophical at this point. Uh, because if you're willing to, uh, to venture out into the, into the void uh, and create your own reality and, and take a shot at, at what you think is right and what other people you think wanna collaborate with you outside of the existing legal st uh, structure and world, then that's become more and more possible to do. And you can do it through these direct listings in, you know, uh, uh, on DEXs uh, and tokenization and creating global communities that, that support and fund your activity through these new models. The, the reality is the market for those funds is faster and more liquid than the traditional, <laughs> but it's minuscule compared to the size, right? The, the, the US mortgage market is 
multiples larger than the entire. Let me let me stop you for one second. So, Brad and James, you're both active angels and investors. Brass tacks. How are your the startups that you're involved in now raising capital, and how do you see that evolving in the very near future, 2021 ish? Like the deals you're working on now. Like what? What's going? What's your thought process? Where's the market? And go go from there. And actually, Brad, let me switch Gordon, to you. Gordon, I think. Um, I think it depends on your strengths, both the strengths of, of your business and the strengths personally of the founding team, mm. how you go about it. And what I mean by that is if you have a very strong angel network that you can tap into, and if you have a lot of wealthy family members, friends who really believe in your ability to execute, then I would recommend taking the path of least resistance and just going to them doing a traditional round at, at the beginning because you already have the support you need to pass that stage and that's the most difficult stage now if you don't have any wealthy friends or family which is the case for most people and you don't have uh, a, a network in angel investors and VCs, which is again most people then how good are you at building a community because your community is going to support your project if you do a token sale, mm -hmm. whether it's on a DEX or a direct or however you, you do it. Still, you're trying to go out to strangers that uh, don't personally know you, but may want to believe in your mission, vision and goals. And that's what we always looked into uh, with the campaigns we did, whether it was equity crowdfunding or whether it was crypto. Like, <clears throat> do you have a mission, vision, and goal that people can relate to and get behind? Because opening your, you know, business uh, up to strangers is no easy feat. And, and if you can't connect with them, then you're not going to be successful. So what is the easiest or the best way or how our projects are going to market exactly depends on their strengths. I have projects that uh, you know I'm a part of where we had a really strong um, investor network behind the founders. So mm -hmm. we did a private sale and, and just use equity and got them funded. I have another project that uh, you know we've been working on for two years and you know we have a community of 200,000 people. So we didn't take any private money. We didn't mm. do any equity sale. We just said, hey, if anyone wants to support this project with our tokens, it's a DAO. There's no equity, there's no company. It's gonna self-govern. The community is gonna decide how it grows. Then, you know, and that was uh, fully subscribed to and it worked just because there was the community, there were those pools of people that really wanted to see it come to life. So it depends on this the project. This is kind of the Xavier Needy thing of on... build the community and the funding will come. Yes. Interesting. Go on. That, that's it. I mean, there's no right or wrong way to do it. It just play to your strengths. If you don't have any connections and you don't have a community, then you need to start building one or the other. You right, know, so let, me, let, me, let me set this up for James. J James, you, you, you did a great job a couple of weeks ago on Digital Week Online. You basically supported a whole half day of fa fascinating sessions, including some of the startups you're involved in, including one that has some really amazing augmented reality technology. You're clearly an investor and an advisor. Today, working with them to raise capital, what's going through your mind? What are you doing? Well, um, fundraising is just another example of problem solving, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, my view on problem solving is you work backwards. You figure out what you're trying to achieve, and then you draw a line to where you are now, and you hope it's a straight line, but it never ends up being straight. Huh. Um, and and you, start, you, know, you start easing down the road. Uh, and so uh, you know, when you look at fundraising, the, the key to fundraising is you need at the end to have a community of people who are like-minded, who are willing to throw capital at you, right? And so you need to work backwards. Who is that community that would support this effort, right? This all goes, again, fractals, everything's the same. This is like funding a ship that you're trying to get from England you know, to the United States and back with tobacco, right? And you got to go find people who are willing to take the bet and who care about tobacco getting to England. 
So you go out and you find those people and you convince them that the investment, the risk is worth the possible return, right? And so it, you build that community. It's all about community. Now, if you, if, now Brad's had a great example. If you start with the community, it's a lot easier. Right, because you already know who they are. You already know what the passion is. You already know what their appetite is. And God forbid you actually even have bi-directional communication, right? <laughs> and so, right? And so, so that, 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 that's how you- Actually, when James, 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 that was a wisdom, that was a nugget of wisdom that you dig that, dig that nugget. The, the bi-directional <laughs> so, communication part, talk about that. So, so, so selling is listening. It's not talking, it's not building, it's not presenting, it's listening, right? And so if you have the community and you have their ear and you can get them, get them to talk about what they want and then you give them what they want, it's much easier to get them to invest. Investing is not just about capital, it's about time, it's about attention, it's about passion, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so what you're trying to do, money is actually turns out is the least important part of this whole puzzle, right? The cheapest commodity in the world today is the US dollar. I mean, how many are they printing, right? How many dollars are there? Every time they need something, they just print another trillion, right? I don't mm -hmm. know why we pay, I don't know why we pay taxes anymore. We've already proven the government can just print the crap, right? So, so yeah. at the, <laughs> Everyone thinks that, that rate fundraising is solving a problem for money, but it's not. It's solving a problem for attention and support, right? It's solving much more basic human needs. And those are all based around community. So I totally, this time, agree with Brad, even though I can't agree, remember what I disagreed about last time. Um, yes, it's so agreeable. Exactly. Well, okay, okay, but James, you, just specifically, like the, the companies that you were featuring on that show, or right. without naming them specific, you, whatever whatever level of privacy you want, you you're clearly involved, and yeah. you're clearly working on helping them build community. Hence, on that show, but brass tacks, the 2020 market, the 2020 market. When you're trying to bring in capital, what, what's the form of doing that now? So I am focused towards community building. So the reason companies come with me is I help them bring together the concept of what you'd be passionate about and why you'd care about the subject matter of the platform mm -hmm. with people who want to participate in it. And in these new tokenized economies can find these more interesting, specific and tailored incentive structures and participation structures that are more democratic and more transparent and more liquid. So for instance, with the company you're talking about, it's called Vivi, and they have a totally cool digital wallet that Very, holds yeah. That holds animated, uh, you know, characters, basically, you know, DC comics and anime, etc., and enables you to hold them in a way that's incredibly cool because they're tactile. So you put the asset into your wallet, and all of a sudden you can interact with it through AR as if it's in your room, and specifically, uh, you know, enjoy your digital assets. Um, and the, the reason I love that company is because their clients are Nintendo, Marvel, mm -hmm. DC. Disney, DreamWorks, okay, all these big companies have these brands, the brands have tens of millions, hundreds of millions of followers. So when Vivi launches in the next couple of weeks, you know, they're not going to do that much marketing because, because Disney is going to talk about how, you know, how all their characters are now available in the Vivi wallet, which actually can be called the Disney wallet. And you're not going to know the back end is Vivi. Right. And Marvel Comics is going to do the same thing, which is owned by Disney, uh, you know, uh, you know, or, you know, DreamWorks is going to come out and, and then Nintendo is going to say your Pokemon are available and now you can buy, sell and trade. You're not going to know the technology. You're not going to know that that's an NFT the trading on a blockchain. If you want it, uh, here's my cheap, uh, my, 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 my cheap plug for the company. You're ah. not going to know that the whole economy is based on the OMI token that you can actually own today that nobody knows has a value. Right, uh, because in the background, it's all accounted for on a distributed ledger, and distributed ledger requires cost to every transaction to protect the network. That's endemic to DLT networks. So there, there's a way to participate now as an investor in the token, even though the activity itself is happening in a world that's not going to even realize that they're touching a, a, a distributed ledger concept. Because the technology doesn't matter. What matters is people love their anime. People love. Superman and Batman, and they want to own it and touch it, and it's cool, right? And that passion enables you to bring together the funding and the community to create the energy that breathes life into the code. Interesting. Um, Mark Moore's, if you 
sure to join in and kind of repeat one of the questions or comments that you had in the chat, you're welcome to. And also Marco, our esteemed alumni speaker and most reliable person on the planet. I gotta I got, I got bring you into here somewhere. Um, Mark, how you doing? Hi there. Hey, uh, you, you, you dropped some good questions or comments into the chat. You're, you're welcome to repeat them or drill in as you see fit. And well, thanks for coming on the show. No problem. The only thing I, I'm sorry my camera's bust. There was a Windows update last month. Hasn't worked properly since. Yeah, actually, um, it's kind of a cool effect, so don't feel so bad about it. I, I normally go on my other laptop, but it's ancient, so I didn't have time this time. Um, okay, go for it. This is anonymity at its best. Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually Mark, Mark, you need like a digitally gravelly voice to go with it. Then it would be great. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. Idea. They stored it. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Maybe this could be a signature kind of look for me. Um, okay, okay, go for it. Questions? Shoot. So, so it wasn't really a question. I just comment. commented that we're, we're kind of effectively kind of in stealth mode at the moment. So we're not really talking about the project because mm -hmm. we're just um, raising funds from a few family and friends. Uh, the project doesn't cost very much because we're all working for free effectively. Mm -hmm. But because it has a real world element, it's going to have a revenue stream. So that revenue stream requires um, some work. And to do that work, there's a company. And what we're going to do is we're going to split the revenue <laughs> stream 50-50 between the uh, people who own the cryptocurrency and the company. Um, so, so that's that's how we're organizing it. So the token, the, the coins have nothing to do with the company apart from some people who own shares in the company own the coins. They're not identical holdings. Um, we intend the economy of the coin to be much wider than people who hold shares in the company. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, people are gonna be incentivized to try and get rid of as many coins as possible. So we spread it as far and wide as possible. Um, so anyway, that's that's how we're doing it. We, we did it through shares in the company just because of the legalities. I'm, I'm in the UK and it was easier to set up in the UK rather than start messing around. Um, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Interesting. Yeah. So thank you for that. So Marco, you made, I changed my background because I just realized, you know, my, my wife's on the show and the kitchen's a little bit messy and, you know, my ego had to get in there. <laughs> So, because you know, I love her, and I gotta make sure that the home looks like it's okay. Um, Marco, you you dropped an interesting comment on the chat, which is your you solve jurisdictional problems. Can you integrate that comment? Can you explain what you meant and then integrate that comment with this discussion about raising capital? But Gordon, I I said yes, Marco, on the comment. I, I know you're do not read this. <laughs> well. Uh, what do you want no, me to say? I mean, uh, it, it, the problem is, is that lawyers get all upset when I start talking about this kind of stuff. I only get upset with uh, you when you interrupt me. I, I'm allowed to interrupt you, but not the other way around. Anyways, just just jurisdictions oh, go. Oh. Ah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 it's, it's a marketplace like, like the same as money, the same as stocks, the same as commodities. Jurisdictions are a marketplace, and there are holes in uh, the major economies of the world that uh, – holes, when I say holes, are uh, problems that people can't figure a way out of inside that jurisdiction. And the whole concept is, has been pointed out already on the call of uh, uh, Panama and Cayman and Malta and uh, et cetera, et cetera, has been about providing the world at large – access to a different jurisdiction that is more friendly towards the things that you wish to do. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, uh, you know, from the snow crash avatar model uh, is, is a classic and is in fact a component of a project I'm currently working on, hmm. um, which we'll talk about next week. <laughs> Sorry, but just um, pause for a second, plug your show next week. Uh, the show Wait, next I week is on together. digital identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I've got the panel together. Uh, this, it's on digital identity. Uh, should we or shouldn't we? <laughs> sounds, sounds great. So, uh, sorry Specifically, self-sovereign, fully decentralized. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, moving on uh, from that, um, the Cayman Islands, for example, gets a short shrift in Hollywood, uh, even though it is probably one of the most compliant regions in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, far more compliant with, with international law than the U.S. is. 
uh, or Europe for that matter, and yet they get blacklisted all the time. Why? Because they're offering a service that you can't get in those jurisdictions and that is attractive to people with money. Mm. And right? And so, so regardless of where world, you're based, you can take advantage of these things, mm -hmm. right? So if you're in the startup world and you want to raise money through a token sale, you can come down here, spend probably, well, I'll come down here per se, but contact somebody here, set up a structure, probably spend about $100,000 in legal fees and corporate setup and all that fun stuff and launch a token sale. And that token sale is domiciled in the Cayman Islands. And as long as you're careful, uh, and this is where U.S. lawyers, please close your ears. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to detail it. But you can avoid all of the jurisdictional nightmares of the U.S. The U.K., funny enough, is another one. They're brilliant as long as you don't live there. <laughs> brilliant as long as you don't live there. You're just like... so, yeah, ooh, let, ooh, me, let me put this idea in front of you. Uh, a, a limited partnership or a limited, uh, a private equity limited partnership, either one, uh, in the UK does not require you to file um, or a, a check accreditation or anything like that if somebody wants to become a limited partner. Okay, that's interesting. So you can bypass is, all the Reg D, Reg A stuff for Americans. In, yes. Okay. Why, why are most of the limited partnerships done out of Jersey then? I think probably because they're UK residents. Ah, uh, probably, yeah, yeah. And the crowd. Yeah, if you're a UK I resident, this is no good to this is no good for you. It's no yeah. good for you. But if you're a non-UK resident, it's awesome. Good point. Good point. Interesting. Richard Ross. Yeah, I see you looking at the camera. Good, good morning, wherever you are. Where are you now? Uh, Western Connecticut, which is next to Westport. That's right. You said that. So you're kind of like James's neighbor a little bit. Oh, where's James? <laughs> James is in Vermont. Uh, my daughter's in school there. Oh, fantastic. <coughs> so I'm there all the time. Hello, so, Richard, can you, can you, you drop some good questions in the chat, and can you, can you address some comments or questions to Brad and to James? We were, we were talking about tokenizing, and I was wondering, um, working with a family office, I've been trying to successfully tokenize artwork for two or three years. And here in New York area, people talk about tokenizing real estate. Maybe they've done that once successfully. And in one of the chats, someone uh, asked about tokenizing film, which is a great idea, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and has anyone successfully tokenized artwork? I mean, like old masters, no, not not this modern crap, but yeah, there's a, there's um, a the real stuff. There's a company called Masterworks uh, that's making a pretty good go. Uh, yes, out. yes, yes. Um, yeah, and that's uh, the problem. I, I've been asked to do this several times. The problem is always how do you verify without going through the same process that happens today, which is pointless if you're just going to replicate the legacy process. Uh, how do you verify that the token actually represents the thing that's sitting in front of you as a piece of art? Well, you can do that. The, 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 the problem, the, so you have to bifurcate the world between living artists and, and artists that are deceased. With an artist that's mm -hmm. alive, you can actually imprint DNA in the, in, the, in, the, in the work of art itself and then tokenize and fractionalize the interest and have the ability to tie the art and know that it's authentic and uh, uh, know its provenance, et cetera. If the artist has passed away, it's much, it's a, it's a different can of, uh, this different kettle of fish. It sounds like a more gruesome procedure. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry, but D you, DNA, DNA doesn't solve well, your well, problem. Well, 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 you can dig up the body. That, that's what I was getting at. <laughs> but, but, well, I, yeah, no, but, but a, actually, forge, a forger can just forge the artwork, steal a hair from the guy's brush, and boom, he's good. Well, no, but I'm gonna, gonna, let me jump. Let, let me jump in here, Mr. Half. I gotta go and come in here and give you some love because I, I gotta go. I gotta run. I gotta. I yes, gotta Pedro. Go. Gotta, uh, famous speaker. Famous online speaker. Everybody. I just wanted to show you guys. I just want to give you guys some love to, to to your guests tonight. I mean, I know both your guests, right? But I know one of them really well, right? So I just want you guys to know. I'm not sure if you're guests or aware. That guy right there, Mr. James Half, is the reason why all of you guys are here on Crypto Wednesdays. Crypto Wednesdays would not be a thing without Crypto Mondays, right? And Crypto Mondays San Juan would not be a thing without Crypto Mondays Miami, which would not be a thing without Crypto Mondays New York, which James has started and pushed. And he was the one that actually started this whole committee driven mission. Now, I want to thank Mr. Half for starting on this mission because honestly, I did this thing for a fundraiser. And right now, I could not, I can't even tell you how massive my network is because of Crypto Mondays San Juan. 
Um, and I want to thank you and I want to give you your flowers while you're here, sir. So keep doing a good job. Keep building the community. And um, and uh, Yasa, I haven't seen you in a while as well. My brother, it's, it's been a while since you've been in PR. We got to get you back down here. Um, you guys, I got to go. I appreciate you guys. Nothing but love for me, man. Y'all have a good day. Pedro, Pedro, much love, buddy. Much love. Okay, so getting getting back to dead artists DNA and digging up graves. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's an interesting question. So you know, I, I also remember like a, a raft of attempts to tokenize real estate a year or so ago, including some hotels. Maybe it was part of an A plus offering also. And I don't hear much about that now. Brad, do you have any sense of that market? Um, yeah, I mean, we worked on uh, a, a project that um, wanted to put uh, real estate transactions on, on a distributed ledger. Mm -hmm. and, and we did couple sales on it, uh, both on the state side and, and in Europe. And um, it's, it's a tough sell. When you're talking about grandmasters for art or big real estate transactions, I mean, in theory, it makes perfect sense. You take a $100 million piece of art or a $100 million uh, you know, uh, building and you divide it into 10,000 little pieces and now everyone um, uh, can make a small meaningful investment in it and feel the pride of ownership. Um, so the theory works great. Now, when you try to put it into practice, it's not necessarily a legal challenge or a, te a technical challenge because you can fractionalize and, and tokenize anything. Um, uh, technologically, that's not, that's not the biggest hurdle. It's the psychology of, of um, you know, provenance and, and how do you authenticate for, for art, of course, and, and uh, you know, for the building, the, the perceived value of, of ownership changes. Um, what, what I've seen is every project that tried to tokenize a building, the token holders don't feel the same connection to that building as people who hold a piece of paper that says they're you know 100 owners of those and, and i i can't explain uh why that is or uh, you know how to overcome it i mean i have a couple ideas but as it stands now there's a big um psychological jump from buying a building and being able to inspect it and go inside and put your name on it or company name, whatever, and, you know, feel like a big boy mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, as opposed to owning even 100% of the tokens that represent a building, because there's a disconnect that we haven't solved yet with the existing solutions. So, and with the, yeah, with the art, I don't, that? I don't think that disconnect, I don't think that disconnect mm -hmm. exists. Uh, I, I think that the problem is, is, uh, is the interference of the, of the regulators. And the centralized system. That too. Again, that, that too. Absolutely. Going, going back to the history of the capital markets, right? Uh, the original, the origins of the stock market uh, were, were again funding ships going back and forth between the United States and England uh, mm -hmm. related to, to trade. Uh, and people would basically own shares of the trip and they would stand on a stone in front of where the stock market is now and basically, you know, broadcast uh, the willingness to trade on the interest. And people would run into the coffee store and mm -hmm. say, a, a ship shrunk, uh, sunk, you know, and people would sell their interests, and then they'd find out that guy was lying, you know, and the whole thing. That's why regulation came in to protect us. The, the original folks. market makers, right? So, <laughs> so, so the so the idea of owning fractionalized interest in uh, economic uh, activities ever since the invention of of double entry accounting, uh, you know, ha has has been evolving. I don't think people have a problem owning uh, owning fractionalized interest of assets. Um, I think that the problem right now is that they're not sure if it's legal and they're not sure about the liquidity and, uh, uh, and how they can, you know, it, it's like, you know, when you, when you make a bet with a bookie, the problem isn't winning the bet. The problem is getting your money back. Right. Uh, and so, you know, that's why whenever I go onto these new sites, like, like a poker site, or I go onto a site, which is, which tells me it's liquid in exchange. The first thing I do is put in money and take it out and see what the actual experience is. Because what I want to know is, can I get my money out? If I can't get my money out, I don't really care what you do. Um, and so uh, when I look at the markets right now, you know, for tokenized, 
uh, assets. Um, you know, I understand that it's hard to prove that you have the actual piece of the, uh, you know, of the Picasso. And, and yes, there's that whole trust factor uh, and, and, you know, and what's the chain of custody. Uh, but there are people who are solving this. And as I said before, in art, uh, it depends if the artist is alive or not, because you can get much more direct attestation uh, from, a, from a living artist. Um, but uh, I think that everything's going to be digitized. I think all the real estate is going to be digitized. I think all the deeds and all the transactions are all going to be tokenized, uh, you know, not necessarily around the concepts that are there today, but just out of the sheer weight of convenience. You know, people follow the path of, la of, of least resistance. Right now, you know, there's certain jurisdictions where as a buyer, you never really know if you own the real estate that you bought, right? And you actually, actually have to buy insurance. You have to pay some guy who knows nothing to collect your money so that in the event someone else says they own it and the legal system doesn't work, that you have insurance to sue, right? Uh, and that's just a waste of time and money. And it's all about keeping those people in business. Uh, who are acting as the intermediaries. And I think that those businesses will go away uh, through, through tokenization. Let me pause one second. So Mark Anstead, if you're, by the way, good morning, Mark. Are you, are you, are you able to unmute yourself? And you, you dropped something interesting into the chat. You dropped a few interesting things into the chat. Are you, are you in yeah, a position to do that? I'm here. Okay, and yeah, can, you, so... can you show your happy face or are you in incognito mode? Um, sure. I can do that. I'm on my mobile device, so my uh, my video might be bouncing around a little bit. You're not the only one. We got Mark Moore's in Deus Ex obscured mode. <laughs> we, got, we got Marco shirtless in the Caymans. You know, this is a capital. Always show. mobile. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, so, very cool. Yeah. Can't complain with that. So Mark answered, um, hey, good morning. So you've dropped a few things. Can you repeat what you just put in the chat and kind of explore that with Brad and James? Sure. Um, so what I said verbatim was... Uh, pe people will purchase and own NFTs in the form of real estate or, frankly, uh, different types of assets uh, for one main reason, which is to make money. That's why a lot of people are getting into cryptocurrency and digital assets and things like that. And in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really have to do with much else. We all talk about, oh, it's easier to do this. It's easier to do that. People just care about one thing is, is making money. Um, and that's why with this big DeFi craze that we saw with like food tokens and all these um, random tokens um, absolutely skyrocketing within a month was because people were able to make money and it was really easy to. And that's what will drive people to use these types of technologies is to make money. That's why we're seeing so much money. Uh, being deposited into, uh, I guess, taking it away from NFTs into uh, decentralized finance, into products like Compound, products like Aave, um, where you can make money where you wouldn't be able to in traditional finance. And when it comes to NFTs, the big concept around them is you can make money. Like, let's look at um, Axie Infinity, for example. That is a uh, gaming platform for NFTs. Uh, now, when you use Axie Infinity, it is a game and you participate on it and you can create these little um, monsters. I, I don't know what they're called. Uh, but uh, what, what are they called? Well, I don't know what they call them, but let's call them creatures. It's, it's less loaded. Okay, creatures. Yeah. Creatures. So uh, by playing the game, you're able to earn uh, a token called a small love potion. Um, to be perfectly honest, I have no clue if it has any value um, whatsoever, but you're able to earn that by playing this game and effectively can then sell that on exchanges. And lo and behold, you can make money from doing that. And uh, that, that's the big premise behind a, a lot of this decentralization is democratizing the ability to earn money cutting now, out the middle so let me pause you a second the, how, how do you do you think that this alters the landscape of raising capital does this apply to a certain niche sort of startup or do you think that there's general applicability here um i, I definitely think it 
I, I don't know if it necessarily has anything to do with raising startups, but I think it had or raising capital for startups. Oh, but uh, what sorry, I, let me say a little bit better. Does, does it bypass the need perhaps to raise startup capital? But go ahead. Um, no, because when you're raising capital, it's just creating a, a business. It's trying to create a, a profitable business, or if you're launching a token, it's trying to create a successful token economy. Right. And in almost every single case, you probably need capital to do that, unless you are a full team of developers and can you, you can do that all in house. Um, but I mean, the the big key there is how you can change the business models mm -hmm. to have your users or customers being able to earn money, potentially alongside you making money. Um, and that's the same way with how some of these um, like DeFi protocols operate uh, with Compound, for example. Uh, they actually take in about, I think it's either 10 or 20% of all of the interest that is paid um, back to the protocol that is stored in a, like a savings pool. So in case uh, the protocol gets hacked, that is how they insure uh, all the money there. And that's just money sitting in a smart contract. And that's money that the protocol is, is generating alongside users who are depositing money into it. So um, let, let, let me pause for a second. Let me, let me throw what you're saying at uh, James, Brad, and actually Marco also, ideally in that order. The, mm -hmm. Guys, given what um, this Mark is saying, not Marco, this Mark is saying, <laughs> um, there's so many repeating names here. Do you, how do you view the impact of DeFi, non-fungible tokens, and the, the general ecosystems he's describing on the worlds of raising capital and startups, is, is there a nexus? So th there's there's a nexus between everything. Everything is fractals because and, and because it's humans that participate in these systems, and mm -hmm. humans are repetitive and have the same needs and you know fears and fear and greed, etc. Right. Um, so so the, the the reality is, if you look at games, everything's going to be gamified. Uh, on these new platforms, and the success is going to the success is going to be when people can look through what Mark just explained, which is a current, a very accurate description of what's happening currently. But the answer is that people want it's not going to be mass adopted until people no longer know that there are tokens involved, mm -hmm. until they no longer know or have to know that there's blockchain. If you bring your business to me and you have to explain to me blockchain, I'm not interested in your business. Right. What I'm interested in is what do humans do and why do they do it and why will they keep doing it on your platform? Right. Uh, and so uh, when I look at the, you know, what the world is going to be gamified, you're going to react to it through computer screens, most likely handheld uh, for, the, for the near future. Um, and what's going to happen is you're going to basically have incentivized behavior that that generates, uh, you know, incentives, obviously, uh, that are a, that you're able to uh, to accept as remuneration, some of which may be pecuniary right and some of it may be meeting meeting a woman some of it may be you know not being bored for the next 30 minutes right and so there's different ways that you'll get paid by these systems and again the distributed ledger ledger platforms what they enable you to do as the creator is to more accurately and specifically deliver that util uh, of, of value back to the individual participants in ways that can incentivize their behavior. And you can, you can basically better discriminate amongst the audience so that you're not wasting compensation on people that don't value that specific type of compensation. Mm. Uh, and so you can build these better systems. Uh, so that's my thought. Also, Marco, stop smoking. Uh, but that's just your father, your father talking to you. Um, uh, 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 but so, so you're this, a year older than me. Stop well, that. Listen, listen, I got to keep. I got to keep the young. Well, Marco, in your, your your brain is too good, and you're too capable to die on us. Exactly. Okay. So, so, anyways, Brad, can you respond to Mark Anstead's point or uh, points? I should say. Well, I mean, he, he has a really valid point that you can speculate on anything without any real or uh, perceived value uh, being attached to it. So saying, well, NFTs are going to be valuable because people want to make money and they want to speculate and hope that they make money is 
hundred percent correct. That applies mm. to any market, anything. Now, in order to create real value behind the project, I, I think there has to be more than just appetite for making money, because um, we see a lot of uh, people that you know companies that do uh, token sales and then their token price crashes as soon as there is secondary market liquidity because mm -hmm. everyone wants to sell because everyone wants to just make money and that's all they care about. They don't understand the project, they don't understand the tokenomics. So mm -hmm. I think it is a part of open markets. And, and, you know, I, I, I agree with them that that's, that desire is always going to be there. I don't know if that's a good basis for using NFTs or, or tokenization of, of uh, infrastructure or art or anything like that, just to go back to what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't believe if you have a, a, you know, Picasso NFT that everyone knows is fake and, you know, that's going to have a lot of uh, opportunities for its holders to make money. Because that was, that was a good integration of Richard they, and they, Mark's they, comments. I like that. Yeah, there, there's, there's no, there's no value there, but I think, um, you know, I, I think DeFi is great because it democratizes access to these, uh, relatively complex financial products that mm. half of the world doesn't have access to. I mean, uh, people are talking about interest rate swaps now. I've mm -hmm. never heard more than two people in my life prior to last three months talk about interest swaps. And I'm in banking and finance. That's why I heard it. So I think the education and democratization of, of access to these things is phenomenal. And I'm super excited about it. Uh, to see a compound, to, to, to see any of these uh, set of products that are coming. And we're building a couple of uh, DeFi products ourselves with, mm -hmm. the, uh, with an actual bank because we want to be able to uh, provide an on-ramp and on off-ramp too. Um, but I'm going to agree wholeheartedly with James that um, you know, I've been preaching, stop talking about blockchain, stop talking about technology, and talk about your product, talk about your service for the past two years. Because, you know, when you, you know, when you download an app or when you buy a phone, how many people know what technology stack is in their phones? I don't think anyone on this call could name every single technology used in their phones. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to know that. You just know that the phone is going to connect you to the outside world, the human connection. You're going to conduct business on it. You go and buy it. And we need to get to that stage with all um, blockchain projects just to have mass adoption. Because if we keep on focusing on the intricacies of the underlying technology, it's just not going to connect with um, everyday people who would otherwise use it. So, so, uh, so back to one second. What, what, back, back when I had hair and went to law school, mm -hmm. um, I had a teacher, uh, a su old Southern judge named Judge Eckridge. And he, used to, and he did criminal law, and he'd want you to stand up and present the case. And his, one of his favorite things he, he said to me once, I got up and talked about it, he goes, don't tell me the law, I wrote the law. Tell me a story, <laughs> right? And, and, that's, and that's really what I'm thinking when I listen to most business pitches is, I don't care about your tech, tell me a story, right? Uh, and that's really what this is all about. Yeah, I was gonna mention, we seem to be conflating two very different things. And it goes back to uh, both, I think, Xavier and Didi's comments about fear Xavier, and greed. Xavier, my friend, Xavier, uh, Xavier Hawk. Go ahead. Yes, that's the guy. <laughs> uh, um, is that uh, the, the fear component, that's where decentralization has its place it's 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 literally the goal of decentralization is to get everybody which will take a long time get everybody to the point where they are comfortable that their interactions are not subject to criminal proceedings and things like that uh from some arbitrary state somewhere in the world but are a community uh agreement a social contract more than a contract with a, uh, a regulatory body. Mm -hmm. The greed side of things is what we're seeing right now. People don't care about the fact that DeFi is decentralized. At least the players in the field don't. They couldn't care less. It could be completely centralized and they don't care because they're making a ton of money. 
they're making a thousand percent a week. Uh, you know, right. anybody w- who's been around the finance world for very long knows that a thousand percent a week is great if you got in early. But you probably, when you got in early, you had no clue you were going to make a thousand percent a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you got out when you saw it was making a thousand percent a week because you knew that can't last. Uh, but the rest of the world is still piling in, and that's fine. All right, this is 1997 through 99 all over again. Or one could argue the uh, ICO pop um, back uh, 2016, 17. But uh, this isn't about the technology. The technology is almost an afterthought. Uh, It's the current buzzword of the day. Dot com in the 90s uh, is is turned into, uh, you know, crypto in in, uh, 2010 to, well, uh, 2010 to 2020. I think the decentralization component is the one that is the hardest one to sell because it doesn't make money. Mm-hmm. It gives, it reduces your, uh, ideally, in, in, when we get to the point where it fully works, it reduces your risk personally, which is the only part that matters. It's got to be viscerally you that benefits from this. Uh, it reduces your risk generally uh, uh, as an actor in the space. And the space being the world around you. And that's the hardest part I think we're going to face is I, I getting know, to the I point I where that's, I, I that's possible. The only thing that matters is reducing personal risk or that's what No, 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 no. Not the only people. thing. Okay. Go ahead. No. I, I, but the, 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 the problem I see currently is that it's easy to get funded if your startup is going to go out and create a new DeFi product. Mm. And as uh, Brad pointed out, yeah, you know, people are talking on the subway about uh, about uh, credit default swaps and credit swaps, and I'm thinking, whoa, good point. I remember back in the '90s, I got into IT in the late '70s, and in the in the late '70s, I knew what a DBMS was, and I knew how uh, SQL queries worked and all that fun stuff. And then I'm I'm riding the subway one day, and I I hear Joe Blow over there talking about uh, a particularly uh, problematic uh, SQL query. And then three, three or four weeks later, I, I start seeing everybody talking about databases. And I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? The whole world caught up? How'd that happen? And this is what's happening here. It's like, well, the minute that, there's like the money in it, you know, people you, learn. You, or, you, or you buy yourself a pair of red sneakers and all of a sudden everyone is wearing red sneakers. You know, there's... Yeah. Wow. Now that I've ever, now that I've ever I bought myself so. red sneakers, I want to be clear to everyone, and, you know, since this is being recorded. <laughs> um, it, okay, it, interesting. Um, let me, you were kind of running down the clock a little bit, but you know, Alex Campa, if you're, if you care to jump in here, since I know you, uh, you're, you're welcome to, I know you have good thoughts. And Marina, my love is on, I guess. Yay. Everyone say hi to my wife. And let's yes. see. Noel, hi, Golden. Hey, Alex. How are you? Good. You're good. Nice so you. we'd love to get your thoughts if you care to share. Um, on what? <laughs> Um, any, anything That's in the, the this whole conversation, well, you, did, yeah. take a moment to introduce yourself because you're, you're a good guy. Okay. Thank, uh, thanks, Gordon. Um, right. Well, I'm working on a project called, um, Sikoba. Um, my background is in, let's say, partly in economics. I've been done work on, on, uh, monetary theory and, uh, this, um, project is an IOU platform. It, it, it's on, I mean, it uses blockchain, but blockchain obviously is not the, the key point, although blockchain brings decentralization and you you don't have to hire auditors to check transactions. I mean, it, it, it does solve certain important uh, problems when you when you have a sort of financial um, financial platform. It also uh, increases trust because there's no central you know um, central body that you have to that you have to uh, to trust. So um, maybe about the DeFi because I'm. A bit skeptical about what's happening on DeFi. I'm not obviously not the only one. Uh, is that right now it's still this kind of self-sustaining system bubble? Maybe. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do you do? You you go in and you get tokens, and then you stake your tokens, and you get more tokens. And the link to the real world is uh, still not very clear. And and I guess the funniest story I've seen somewhere about, uh, somewhere about DeFi is. But they were saying, well, look at this, this poor student. He, he wants to, he needs money. Uh, he goes to the bank and can't get a loan. But look at this. He can go to a default platform, deposit his ether, and get a loan. 
Yes, great, which means he already has Ether or, or right. Bitcoin or something, right? right. So come on. Um, and of course, situations where you have these huge returns at the beginning of certain uh, cycles, uh, that, that, has, that happens, that has happened before. Uh, it, it's not, history shows that these things are not sustainable, that, that, uh, that uh, you know, bubbles happen, uh, which doesn't mean that something useful is not coming out from this, from this DeFi, of course. Uh, but it's uh, still early days, and a lot of this is, um, yeah, I think this bubble will work burst, and it's only after the, the bursting of this first bubble that we'll see the real uh, benefits of, mm. uh, of DeFi. Now, to, to finish uh, and briefly explain where we're coming from, um, our view is that in, in business, historically, all, a lot of business was done on credit. Okay, credit, not in the sense that you borrow something to pay. Credit means you buy something and then, well, how are you going to pay for it? Well, just write it down. We trust each other, right? We've been doing business, so it's credit <coughs> means you don't have to actually pay. You know, you, you owe something, it's an mm -hmm. IOU, and possibly you can either settle later or do an offsetting trade in the meantime. And so this is still very much used in developing countries by, you know, mostly by small companies, uh, micro companies. Uh, of which there are very many in the world. And so our idea is to say, well, this informal credit where we just write down the debts and, and then and settle them, et cetera, is very, I mean, it's informal, it's under the radar. It's, there's no records of it. Uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's informal and partly inefficient. And we bring in a tool to make it, to make it much more efficient to things that are recorded on blockchain. So you can't then say, you know, I have 50, no, no, it was only 40. Mm -hmm. You can get, you know, your clearing, you can, you can have a create um, an audit trail with that you may someday, you know, in a, a small business um, getting an audit trail of its transaction on a blockchain that the business may well be unbanked. Eventually with that audit trail, you can go to a banker and say, hey, look, I, I do have a credit history, which which today they can't, even if they are in business for a long time, they do business. It's it's not, not recorded anywhere because they they're not in they don't don't transact using a bank. So when they go to see a banker, they they have nothing to show. Okay, so we're trying actually, to actually actually you know address that, a that, real that's a very interesting point. That, that idea that transactions are going to be recorded on the blockchain, and that increased level of audit and history may be an alternative way of establishing credit worthiness. Exactly. That's, that's a very, that's a very, that's a very deep yeah. thought. Thank you. It's good. Yeah. And, and, and I'm just briefly coming back to clearing, which is a very important uh, aspect of our, of our system is that, you know, you've got these circular debts, you know, the A owes B, B owes C, C owes A. And of course, if they sit around the table, they notice this and they can clear mm -hmm. the debt, right? You don't need that much. You need much less money if there's a circular debt. If uh, you have this kind of situation and the three companies, let's say, who, who have this circular debt, um, you know, don't, they're just in different parts of town, they may not actually have the money to settle. But, you, you know, when you have these situations, you don't need the money to settle. All you need is an efficient clearing system. So mm -hmm. that's what we bring in. The clearing system, the fact that, that things are recorded, there's also a few other features that we have. Alex, so, I, I, I'm going to pause you just because we're heading up an hour, and I think you deserve your own share, yeah. to be honest. Um, uh, invite me. Yeah, yeah, yeah well... <laughs> Well, you have to make yourself known, man. There's a lot of, you know, I, I'm dealing with cats. I'm dealing with all kinds of, you know, this yeah, is my, yeah. my co-host right here. I don't know if you can see. Um, yeah. So, yeah, this is Soma. Soma decides to park every time I'm doing a show. So I, I think we're going to start landing this plane, but I, I want to get a final comment in this order. Um, Xavier, I want you to jump in and make an initial comment if you care to. James, uh, Brad, Marco, I love you, but you've already spoken a lot and we're going to have you on your own show next week. And then I think we'll wrap it up. So Xavier, if you want to drop a little knowledge bomb or provocative bomb in there before we get handed to James and Brad, go for it. No, thank you so much, Brad, James. I, I've, everything that you guys have been saying has been spot on. And I think all of us in the, in the chat here really like align on those, on those points. Um, I don't have a comment. I have more of a question and it's really just like brass tacks like we were talking about. So what, in your guys' opinion, is the best capital raise strategy, um, according to you, in regards to building a, a, a DAO, a corporate DAO, let's say? So and James I know actually has to scoot to another meeting. So James, if you're still on, give us your quick bit of wisdom. You're on mute. Uh, James, you What's there? The you question? there? 
What's the question? Yeah, the, I'm, I'm letting <laughs> you talk fast because you have a meeting. Xavier, short version. The question is, what is the best capital raise structure today in the shifting, uh, you know, in the shifting minds minefield that is uh, the capital if, raise? If you're, if, you're, if you're willing to hold your nose and jump in, it's these uh, direct uh, distributions through DEXs. If you're willing to hold your nose and jump in and uh, and uh, ask for forgiveness, not permission. Fantastic. James, direct... I, thank you for making the time. I know you have your next meeting that. and it's a big I one. Love I love you all. Thank you all for, 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 for letting me pontificate. And Gordon, you're fantastic. awesome. Sandra, fantastic. And the, 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 the participation of the, of the community here is fantastic. It, thank it, you. It's great. Hi, James, good luck. Brad. Hi, James. Gordon. Xavier, repeat for Brad. And Brad, now you can put No, I, I, I can repeat this question. What's the best method of raising capital right now for a corporate DAO? Yes. I'm, I'm going to say just because he mentioned a uh, decentralized autonomous organization, I'm going to say tokens. And because selling equity and trying to conform uh, an autonomous organization, and obviously each DAO is different and they have different structures, different levels of autonomy. But let's assume, you know, he, he's planning to build a, a fully autonomous model. Then it would be tokens to build the community, to have one set of stakeholders that are going to contribute to that organization. Um, otherwise, if you try to do it with equity, th there's going to be challenges. But in general, I'm going to reiterate what I said earlier. I think the best way is to play to your strengths. If you have a quick and easy way to raise capital, traditional way, do your seed that way, build your technology, build your MVP, build your business. If you don't have that, but you know you can appeal to a large group of people, then uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's better suited for a token sale. Uh, because you can reach, you can have a global reach, engage more people, and build a bigger community. Beautiful, um, Beautiful. guys. We're 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 up. It's that time. Uh, Sander, shall we shall we land the plane? As I like to say. You know, Gordon. If we could continue for another two hours, I think we could fill the show. Yes. <laughs> I would like to get also Alex, Alex Kampa, in, the, in one of our next shows. Uh, really a good contribution. Alex, we're looking forward to see you as one of the speakers in the next couple of weeks. So, Gordon, let's plan that. Um, Great, thank you. I, I, I think what our speakers of, to, of today uh, brought to the table and the interaction, not only in the chat group, but all, you know, all the people that participated was really good. And this is what we, what we saw four months ago when we just started with Crypto Wednesday. So we're very grateful to have you guys here. Next week, new show different guest speaker or maybe guest speakers. We have to- uh, Actually, I'm sorry, just real quick. So this, this is a very recent development, but Marco assembled a great panel for us next week. Um, sorry, Sander, we hadn't even talked about it yet, but I, I threw it out to Marco and he jumped on it. So we have Marco next week and then Sander, please continue. Yeah, so we have Marco next week. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, now, dear co-host, now you know. <laughs> no, I, I think it's great because I appreciate everybody's, you know, participation, Re really cool. But we have to make a special recognition to Marco because Marco has been here from the first show on, not only listening, but contributing, you know, sharing his wisdom, sharing insights. We are networking behind the scenes. We have got a really active Telegram group. I would like all you all to invite also to join that, join the community and also spread the word. So let's, let's get more and more people into the community so we can, you know, bring out the message and help other people. That's, that's the primary goal. So for now, we're going to close up. Thank you all for joining. Uh, uh, stay tuned for the recording so you can rewatch or send it to your friends. We look forward to seeing you next week with Marco and some other people. On behalf of Gordon and myself, stay healthy and we'll see you next week. And, and I, I'm sorry, I'm going to add something just in response to the chat. If you want to know about our shows, Join the Telegram group or find us on Facebook or LinkedIn. It's just Crypto Wednesdays. It's an easy find. And we always announce the shows. But and Or reach out to us privately or directly, I guess, on Facebook or LinkedIn. We'll add you to the groups. You, you won't miss a thing. So, Sander, thank you so much. Thank you to our guests. Thank you to our fantastic audience. And that's it. Happy Crypto Wednesdays. See you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.